Hi and welcome to Mondraker TV. For today's video, we're going to be looking at the importance of SAG and showing you how to get it set up on your full suspension mountain bike. Now setting up SAG is something that's easy to overlook and also easy to not get quite right, but it makes a significant difference to how the suspension tracks on your mountain bike. Spend 10 minutes doing this before you ride and your bike is going to feel brilliant. Firstly, let's talk about what SAG actually is. Now in simple terms, it's the amount your suspension compresses under your body weight when you get on the bike. Now, this is absolutely vital to the action of the suspension on your bike because of the fact it has to provide a sprung resistance against your body weight and that also allows the wheels to track the contours of the ground. The whole point of suspension is to allow the wheels to stay on the ground as much as possible to give you traction and grip. If your wheels are skipping around on the ground, they're not going to give you those things. Obviously, the other benefit with suspension is it increases your ride comfort, and that goes hand in hand with the correct amount of sag. Now, if you don't have enough sag, your bike's going to feel very firm and very harsh, and definitely not as the suspension designers of your bike intended. Now, if you're to ride your bike too soft with too much sag, not only is the bike going to sit very low to the ground and you'll be basically risking striking your feet on, on rocks, for example, as you're pedaling over steps and things, but also the suspension units, you're gonna be sat in a point of that travel where they're not reacting properly. So you'll find the bike just feels wallowy and just doesn't feel as it should. Like I said, spend the time getting a sag correct and your bike will perform brilliantly. Okay, so what is the correct amount of sag then that you need for your bike? Well, the truth is this will vary between all bikes on the market, uh, the style of bike you're riding and the manner in which you're gonna be riding it. So the best thing is to refer to what your manufacturer suggests for the bike and for the intention. They will give you a base. For example, this Fox 36 fork is recommended that I run this with 20% sag and the rear end of this bike is between 30 and 35% according to what Mondraker recommend for the specific design of this suspension. Now there's two ways to get this amount, uh, to translate this into the amount of air pressure you need to put into these. Now the first way is literally looking at a chart. So on the back of these forks, for example, there is a chart that correlates to your rider weight and it will give you a guideline air pressure to put in the fork. And then the same, I'm gonna throw a chart on screen now. Mondraker have one of these for every single bike in their range and you'll find whatever manufactured bike you are riding, you'll have the same thing on their website. So you'll be able to put in your weight in pounds or kilograms and you'll make a recommendation to get to the required amount of sag. So these will always be the best places to start. Of course, there's other ways to do this as well. You can figure this out yourself. So if you know it's 20% sag that you need on the fork, you can do a simple calculation. So this fork has 160 millimeters of travel and multiply that by 20, divide that by 100. That will give you 32. So that's 32 millimeters of sag. That's what I would need to get in terms of getting that 20% sag. Now you can apply that same calculation to rear shocks on bikes, although there's something important to note with virtually all shocks on the market. This one, for example, has a 60 millimeter stroke on there. If your one has a 60 millimeter stroke, that might not be the actual travel that the shock gets. Quite often manufacturers will use a spacer on the inside of the shock, and instead of 60, it might be 57.5 millimeters that a shock actually achieves because of the suspension design. So the best thing to do is check this on your manufacturer website, look at a spec sheet of the bike, and it will say something like 230 by 57.5. That 57.5 will be the measurement of the amount of travel it has. So you'd use that to make your calculation from. It really is quite simple to do this. You just have to be methodical. Now, before we move on to actually setting the sag, there's a few other things you need to know. So we're gonna be basing this on a bike that have air shocks and air suspension on the front. This is the most common variant you see across the board in mountain biking because of the fact that it can be infinitely tuned no matter what your ride away and what your preferences are. However, you can get bikes that have coil shocks. Now we'll deal with that in a separate video because it's a bit more specialist than what most people will need. Okay, so you're gonna need a few tools for this. And the first one is a shock pump. Now, if you can, try and get a hold of one that's got a digital display on it. It just makes it a bit easier to get an accurate reading 
on there. Of course, you can do this with the regular ones with a normal display, but again, it does make it a bit easier for you. Now, some shock pumps will have a conventional valve like this one on here. Other ones, you'll find it has an additional control ring. Now, the control ring on there can make it easier to get a more accurate reading because of the fact that you can disconnect that and you don't lose the air from the actual shock as you actually remove it. So sometimes, let's say you were trying to get 95 PSI, on a pump like this, you might end up putting, say, 98 PSI in, knowing that when you disconnect the pump, a small amount of air will come out at the same time, and that would get you back to 95. This is something that you will learn with whatever pump you have. Uh, so don't be too worried about it, it's just something to bear in mind. Now the next thing is something to measure the amount of sag. The obvious thing is a ruler or a tape measure, absolutely fine. If you have access to digital calipers or verniers, these make it a lot easier because you can get a very accurate reading on there for the same reason a digital shock pump. But again, it's not essential. Now for taking the actual reading, it's really important to check that your bike has O-rings on the shock shaft and on one of the fork legs. So on a Fox fork, it tends to be on the left hand leg as you're a rider looking down. So you can see the O-ring here. As you sit on the bike, you would set the O-ring against the seal, get off the bike and the amount is moved. You can then measure that to calculate the percentage. If for example, your bike doesn't have that on the fork or the shock, like check both legs, it could have perished and just fallen off perhaps. You can use a cable tie to achieve the same thing, but make sure that you remove it when you do continue to ride afterwards once you've set it up, because it could scratch the legs of your fork. So just have it there to check the settings. And of course, when you remove it, take the greatest care possible to make sure you can't scratch the legs of the fork, the stanchions there, because uh, that can affect the performance in other ways. And the last thing you need to do before getting the sag set up on your bike is to make sure your fork and your shock have got all the damping removed from the equation. Now, this is really important because if you were to accidentally have, say, the climb switch activated on your shock and you try and set the sag up, it's not going to be moving like it should do. The same goes for compression or rebound on your fork. So what you want to do is make sure you've got your compression wound fully off. So anti-clockwise for compression, which is your blue dials, uh, universally on forks and shocks, red will be the rebound. So I'm just going to unwind these all the way. Now you don't want to force it just till it naturally stops at the end. So this one has high and low speed compression to make sure you do those. The same goes for the shock absorber on the back. Anti-clockwise to undo that. Make sure the climb switch is open. And then the same for the rebound. Rebound is the red dial on this Fox fork. It has a cap on the bottom just to protect it. So you remove the cap. Again, undo these. And then that way, the sag that you dial in with your air pressure on here is not hindered by the damping. You would then set your damping up separately. So as we know, there's two methods now to get to your desired amount of sag. Now for all Mondraker bikes, you have charts on their website and it correlates to how much body weight you have. So I'm just gonna throw the one on screen that's relative to this bike, the NEAT. And as you can see there, there's a column down the left-hand side and it has weight indications. So at the moment, I'm weighing in around 95 kilograms. Now this is something very important to factor in. If you're the sort of rider that rides with a heavy camera bag or lots of luggage and things like that, you should weigh yourself in your riding gear with the bags on to get an accurate reading. So we're gonna do this based on what I'm wearing right now. So according to this chart, I should be inflating a fork to achieve the 20% sag, approximately 95 PSI. And it also says for the rear shock, I need to be looking at about 230 PSI. So we're gonna go through and do this process now. Then we're gonna set that sag using the O-rings to see where we are. And this is where I'm gonna use a friend to help me out here. Now we're gonna do the fork first and carefully you need to thread on the shock pump onto the Schrader air valve on the top. Take care doing this because of the fact it can be very easy to cross thread things. But I should need to tell you that a pump obviously is not that expensive but your fork and your shock are very expensive so just take care here. Sometimes it's good to back it off slightly first before you tighten it on just to make sure the threads aren't all crossed or anything. And the same thing applies for that rear shock. So pretty simplistic for the fork. I'm gonna to inflate to 95 PSI, get a reading here on the shock that says 95. I'm actually gonna go a tiny bit more, just compensating for the fact that there's gonna be a slight bit of air lost in that 
shock pump itself when I remove it. So I'm going to go to 97 and I think that's going to get me about right to start with. Next up is to move to the rear shock and do the same thing. If you're using Olin's forks, there's two chambers to inflate. Always do the lower one first and use the chart on the fork itself to get your base settings. Now, something important to note with forks and shocks, but especially with shocks, they both have positive and negative air chambers. What you're inflating is the positive air chamber. Now on suspension forks, they have a little transfer port as you're inflating, it will naturally allow the air to move between them. Okay, so it charges that negative. You don't really have to inflate anything yourself there. Compress the fork a few times just to make sure and then check your air pressure again. With the shock, it's a little bit different. You have to actually cycle the shock through an amount of travel and amount of times to get it to do this. With Fox shocks, they say get it up to your sag. So in this case, we're gonna to get to 230 PSI. They say to leave the shock pump on and then cycle the bike through about a quarter or 25% of the travel up to 10 times. Then check the reading on the shock pump and you might need to add some more pressure to get it back to the desired amount. Olin's is pretty much the same process. With rock shocks, they say to get it to the sag pressure, then to remove the shock and then cycle through as deep as you can up to five times to do this. Now, depending on the brand you have on your bike, if you don't have Fox, RockShox or Rollins, uh, you just want to make sure to charge that negative chamber, you're doing it the right way. Right, so the idea is I get on the bike now, I bounce up and down a couple of times to let everything settle, then very carefully move the O-ring down and see if I can do this one as well. And then carefully without disturbing the bike. So I'm in my sort of riding position here, so this is pretty accurate. Just going to gently sit down, put my feet down and off the bike. And that is going to be a good indication of where our sag point is for the front and rear. So let's measure these and then we can see where we are if we need to add or subtract more pressure. Now, of course, you can do that just leaning up against a tree or a wall, perhaps in your garden. Uh, but it's always easier if you've got someone to help. And actually, it's easier if they know what they're doing to get them to actually do this for you so you don't disturb the bike. But I'm quite comfortable doing this. Okay, so as I calculated to get 20% sag for the fork, I need 32 millimeters. Um, so hopefully that's gonna be pretty close to that here. So I'm using the digital calipers here. If you're gonna use these, make sure you don't scratch your stanchion tube, be very careful. So let's just see where we are. I'm gonna let it touch the seal and move this up. Okay, so we're on just 33.88. So it's just a little bit soft. So I'm gonna get a tiny bit more air pressure in here, but that's a pretty good ballpark. Now I didn't expect it to be that close, to be honest, that's um, pretty lucky. So we're gonna measure the rear as well. You've gotta bear in mind, this is the point where you need to be patient. It could be easy for me at this point to be like, now that's fine, but I wanna get it to what's recommended. Then we go and ride and we see how the bike feels. So of course, at that point, it might think that, oh, it feels too harsh for me. I need to remove some air but I'm always gonna start with the recommended settings first. Okay, so because of the fact that the rear shock here is quite difficult to get to on this bike and it could well be on yours, I'm gonna use a tape measure to measure where the sag point is. So what I'm looking for here uh, is 19.25 millimeters and that's gonna give me 35% sag if that's correct. So we're just gonna see how close we are to that. Um, I'm expecting to probably have to change this. It's definitely a trial and error type setup. Do you know what, that's that's on 20 millimeters there. So that's perhaps a, a tiny bit over. Uh, so I'm just gonna try and get a little bit more air pressure in there. And I think we're pretty close to where I need to be with this bike. So that's based on it having 150 millimeters of travel and the back end of the bike and me needing 35% sag. To calculate that, it's a bit different to the forks. You don't do the rear wheel travel, you do the shock travel. And this particular shock is a 55 millimeter travel shock. Uh, Obviously 35% of that is 19.25 and we've got 20 there. So tiny bit more air in there. And I think we're good there with the base setting. And what you would then do is move on to getting the damping settings. Okay, so we've got our base settings set up with a sag, 35% on the rear and 20% on the front. Uh, that's what's recommended to start with. Like I said, best thing to do once you've got that, 
go and ride. So I'm just gonna go and ride some of these local trails, get a feel for the bike, and obviously I have to be prepared for making some adjustments on the go. That's the name of the game. Let's get out there. Ah, oh, tell you what, that's not bad for pretty much base settings. Taking a little bit of air out the front fork, it was just a little harsh for me. Adjusted the low speed compression, but I'm pretty happy with that for good base settings. So running a touch over 20% on the front, 35 on the rear, bang on for me. Now, like I said, it's important to get to the base settings and then work from there. Otherwise you have nothing to work from. Now, hopefully this video has been helpful for you. If you've got any questions about setting up your SAG, let us know down there. I did say we'll do something with coil shocks at a later date, so make sure you subscribe to the channel and you'll see that popping up on your newsfeed there. Uh, thanks for watching. See you soon.